Coming up, the first Americans Museum in Oklahoma City opened last weekend. The museum's deputy director, Shoshana Wasserman, will join us to share more about the journey to open this epic museum. Plus, in Alaska, seal hunting is a way of life, and it's being threatened by climate change. We'll take a look at how the Arctic works best when it's cold. I'm Patty Tholohunva. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from Indian Country Today. Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that, sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. is Indian Country Today. Esquilly, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholohungva. President Joe Biden is reviving the Tribal Nations Summit. It was not held during the Trump administration after being started by President Barack Obama. He held it all eight years when he was in office. The summit will take place the first week of November. The virtual summit will bring tribal and top leaders in the White House together to discuss key issues, policy initiatives, and goals for Indian country. More details on the Tribal Nations Summit will be released soon. Ten indigenous people are victorious in Canada's national elections, and that's the same number elected in the last election cycle. There were also a record number of indigenous candidates who ran for parliament this year, 77 in total. The government markup stayed the same as before the election was held after election results came in on Tuesday. One indigenous voice is Blake Darjeelay, representing the new Democratic Party. He flipped a seat in the provincial capital city of Alberta, which is a conservative-dominated district. And he's from the Fishing Lake Métis settlement and is two-spirited. He has described himself as a climate champion. Another first in this election, Melissa Ridgen made history by being the first indigenous journalist to ask a question at a nationally televised election debate. She is Red River Métis. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's party, the Liberal Party, secured a victory in the parliamentary elections, but failed to get the majority he wanted. That means he will need votes from the new Democratic Party in order to pass budget and other legislation. South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem is asking the state's Department of Education to delay changes to social studies standards for up to one year. Noem says additional time is needed to allow more people to weigh in on the recommendations. The Education Department reports it's received 600 public comments, with the majority opposed to the proposed standards. The resistance stems from the removal of more than a dozen references to Native American education on the Ochete Shakoi. Those references were initially included in an early draft proposed by members of a working group. The South Dakota Education Equity Coalition, which is calling for the governor's resignation, would like the first scheduled hearing to be pushed back a month and moved to a larger venue. The University of New Mexico is naming the nation's first indigenous chair of an architecture department. Chris Cornelius is a citizen of the United Nation of Wisconsin and founded Studio Indigenous, which is a design and consulting firm serving indigenous clients. He's worked on projects for his nation, like the Oneida Veterans Memorial and the Oneida Maple Sugar Camps. Cornelius has been a faculty member in the Department of Architecture at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee since 2004. He will join UNM's School of Architecture and Planning at the start of November. An introductory class on climate change at the University of Washington will offer an indigenous perspective. Dr. Jessica Hernandez is a transnational scholar, scientist, and community advocate. Her roots are Zapotec and Maya Chiorti. She will be teaching the course and is the first indigenous professor to offer such a class at the University of Washington. She says her course will have a native voice in the climate change discussion. You know, policymakers, lawmakers are having these conversations on how to address climate science and climate change and 
you know, reduce the carbon emissions. I think that it's time for indigenous peoples to get a seat at the table and also be able to lead those tables because oftentimes we see how tribal consultation is non-existent when we talk about climate policy. Hernandez says indigenous communities have already been impacted by climate change and her course will include what tribes have already done to help slow down the process. Her class will begin at the end of this month. In Wisconsin, six tribes are suing to stop the hunting season for gray wolves. The Chippewa tribe says treaties give them rights to half of the wolf quota in territory they ceded to the U.S. back in the mid-1800s. The tribal lawsuit comes three weeks after wildlife advocacy groups sued to stop Wisconsin's wolf hunt. They want to avoid a state law, which is mandating annual hunts, arguing the laws don't give wildlife managers any leeway to consider population estimates. The tribe says instead of hunting the wolves, they want to protect them. Last year, the State Department of Natural Resources set the quota at 119, but hunters killed 218 wolves in just four days, forcing an early end to the season. And those are the headlines for Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thalonghungva. When we come back, after decades in the making, the First Americans Museum in Oklahoma City opens. And later, Megan Sullivan explains how climate change is harming the seal hunting season for Inupiaq people. Shoshona Wasserman has been a big part of the success of the opening of the First Americans Museum in Oklahoma City, which has been in the making for decades now. She's currently the deputy director of the museum. She joins us now to tell us about the grand opening last weekend. Welcome, Shoshana. Good morning. How are you? Good. How did it feel opening those doors? It was amazing. There were so many people that had been a part of this you know, journey for so, so many years, all gathered there together. And I think that camaraderie and just that, uh, you know, elated feeling was, was very contagious. We saw all over social media, people posting pictures in front and very much the fan um, bonanza that you would expect. Maybe tell us about some of the people that were there. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a lot of people from from our constituencies and from our and our customer base. Um, you know, as you know, our constituents are uh, all of the tribal folks, and our customers are people that are going to come to the museum that have an interest in learning about all of these unique histories. And so it was really the first time we brought those two together. And it was beautiful. We had fashion shows. We had tribal, uh, you know, demonstrations in the courtyard. We had a festival plaza that had, of course, our grand opening ceremony, but it also had all kinds of activities, bands, and then, of course, the amazing um, exhibitions that, you know, everybody was coming to see for the first time. So really a beautiful moment in time after many, many years, gorgeous weather, and uh, we just could not have been more blessed. At its core, a museum is about storytelling. Uh, what's the most important story for people to take away from their experience at the museum? Well, you know, I think we're telling human stories. Um, they are our native stories. They are all in first person voice. These are the, we are continuing a long standing tradition of oral storytelling that is, you know, something that we are known for in our many cultures. We pass down knowledge, we pass down histories from generation to generation. And one of the things that I am so proud of is that we continue that tradition and we allow for all of the different perspectives. You know, even on grand opening day with the nearly 7,000 people that attended the opening, we're all gonna remember that day differently. We were all gathered there together at the same time, even in the same locations at the same moments, but we will have different perspectives. And history is complex 
And I think that's what this museum allows us to do is re remember those histories with the multi-dimensionality that is, is a part of our histories. We have 39 distinct nations, different cultural life ways, different languages, different stories of originating here in this place that we now call Oklahoma or the many, many removals to this place that we now call home. And so I think what I'm most proud of is the fact that all of those stories have room and a place to breathe and grow here in this place. That complexity of stories is so amazing when you think about it. And I think one of the challenges for any museum, especially involving Native Americans, is you want to have people walk in and see themselves, but you also want to see people from the community come away and with a new appreciation. Th those are different missions. How do you do on th that score? Well, I think we did some things very strategically. Um, so one of the things for all of our native participants, there were, you know, what we call Easter eggs in, in the museum field. There were all kinds of things in the museum that were nuances, that were evidence of authenticity, of cultural knowingness. We have an all native curatorial staff. So we really um, infused all of that knowingness into the museum. And Native people walked away understanding those nuances. Something as simple as in our, and this is just a trite example, but in our museum store, um, in the youth and family section, as you leave that section, it says, until we meet again. It doesn't say goodbye, doesn't say thank you. Many of us don't have uh, words for goodbye in our native language. We have that expression of until we see you again. And so there were things like that all, you know, incorporated into, uh, by design, into the experience. And if you, if you didn't understand that, that was fine. But, you know, it was there for the native constituents. And for our customers who are typically non-native and coming to learn about our stories, we wanted to be as, even though it is all told in first person, we wanted to be as inclusive as possible and welcoming. And we didn't want there to be any questions. There were all kinds of interactives that were added into the exhibition. Like, what are you caught? What, what's the, you know, people struggle all the time. Is it Indian, Native Americans, First Americans? You know, so we kind of, we kind of um, met people where they were. And I like to think that we take people from what they think they know about our cultures and our history to perhaps a place that maybe they don't know or aren't as familiar with, but we do it in a very hospitable, native friendly, you know, kind of manner. Speaking of taking people to what they think they know, Oklahoma's got some really sharp divisions right now over the role of Native Americans, especially tribes in the state. Do you think over time the museum will change that perception? Will help to change that perception? I hope so. I mean, one of the ways that that happens, I think, is this narrative of excellence of showing your neighbors doing extraordinary things. And that's something that surfaces in the story. That's right. Um, you know, we, um, we started in time immemorial, establishing our histories not in 1492, but with our origin stories and our, um, and we equate that, you know, we gave people a shorthand so that they would understand these aren't le legends and myths, this, these are our Genesis stories. So again, we meet them where they are and then take them to a new place. And we go through one whole section of the Oklahoma exhibition that is 500 years of history um, and time immemorial. So really much more than that 500 years of history, but 500 years of what they know. And then we, we complete that experience with the contemporary realities. And so I think that's important to create a balanced experience. One of the customer groups I wanna ask you about that I think is um, ultimately extremely important is school children. H how much is that part of the planning? Yeah, you know, um, what you see right now are, are two incredible 10-year exhibitions that will be up, but that what we were trying to do with all of our festival activities was to impart all of the programming that we're going to be presenting, because that's really what makes us a living museum, 
And I think we established a really unique partnership with the tribes where each of the tribes will have an opportunity to come showcase what they're doing at the museum. And that will be part of that educational experience. Of course, we have to get back to a time where travel you know, is uh, appropriate with our school groups. Um, but there's lots of ways that we can deliver those as we all know, as we're doing right now. Uh, there's a lot of ways that we can deliver that, but we really hope to be um, a really powerful uh, resource for schools in educational curriculum, you know, over, over the lifetime of this museum. So really important, lots of activities that were embedded, uh, like I was mentioning, interactive experiences so that young people could access the experience as well as scholars and as well as you know museum goers or tourism folks that are just gonna perhaps be there for two hours. So we really thought about our exhibitions with all of those audiences in mind, and we tried to deliver something very special to them. We're going to be rolling out a new experience soon that is basically a map. So for example, if you're a tribal member and you're coming to the museum and you want to see all of the locations in the exhibitions that pertain to your tribe, or you're a school teacher and you're studying a particular era of time, all of the removals or treaties or whatnot, you can access that information um, in a printout and be able to come back to the museum again and again and experience it thematically in a lot of different ways. A long time ago when I was a newspaper editor, I used to slip into restaurants and watch people read to see where they went. Do you do that in the museum world? Of course we did. You know, we had some informal testing going on already to begin and, and to begin to understand people's dwell times in different areas. Of course, our experiences vary in Oklahoma, um, which is the exhibition, you know, that really deals with the collective history and contemporary reality of uh, our tribes here. We have a lot of very rich media embedded into all of that. And in fact, in every chapter of that history, we have a portrait screen and we have some members of our community who serve as your cultural ambassador. So if perhaps you're there on a sleepy Wednesday when you know um, there's not a self-guided tour um, during that particular time, you still have that connection to native people kind of helping you experience the exhibition. And so it was very interesting to see how much time people would spend at, the, at, at those um, interactives. And we, we were really surprised. Um, you know, people would have liked to have spent more time, but because of the crowds and number of people, you know, they had to move through a little faster. So we'll, we'll uh, continue to study those things, but um, we were really, really pleased with how captivating the exhibition seemed to be for people. Well, that just means they'll come back. Thank you so much, Shoshana. Yes. When we come back, we'll look at the practice of seal hunting. Hunting for seals is a way of life for the Nupiaq, but with climate change, future generations may not be able to rely on this source of food. ICT's special correspondent, Megan Sullivan, wrote about this issue in her story, Drastic Changes, Sea Ice Levels Affecting Seal Hunting. One of the most impactful quotes in the story is from a man who directs the environmental program in Kotzebue. He said, the Arctic works best when it's cold. The colder, the better because everything's adapted for that. Megan joins us now to tell us more about this issue facing Inupiaq people. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. So tell us uh, the framework of the story. So basically it's based on this recent study released, released by the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, and the study actually was a collaborative effort between Kotzebue elders, 
um, local scientists, local hunters, and the university. And they had been tracking changes in the ice for the past decade. And what they found was essentially that the ice is breaking up about a month earlier than it used to, which is affecting the Inupiat's ability to, um, to do their annual traditional seal hunt. Um, so it's kind of all connected and it was great to hear the different ways that people were able to contribute to the study in order to get kind of more of a holistic view of what's going on. It's uh, almost 100 degrees today in Phoenix, so we really want to hear today why it's so important to be cold. Right. Well, as um, Alex, the director of Cots Views Environmental Program, said it best, the Arctic works best when it's cold. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways I had from the story was hearing Bobby, one of the elders, talk, um, and he he has been noticing changes since the 50s, to be honest, um, but really noticeable changes in the land between in the last decade. And what he really emphasized was how interconnected everything was. So, you know, if there's a small change with a tiny population of fish, it's going to affect everything from the whales to the seals to the people who live there. And so when, as you can imagine, when an entire ecosystem that relies on ice is thrown off by less ice and warmer temperatures, um, there's gonna be changes in, in every different capacity. So just kind of hearing his own initial observations and hearing also what his father used to say um, back when his father was an elder, really goes to show how interconnected that ecosystem is. I think that one thing that people really don't understand is how this is also a safety issue. Uh, if you're out on the ice hunting seals and suddenly it breaks away and you're at risk of really harm. Yeah, it's a safety issue because, you know, there's practices revolving around the ice. Um, people know how to use the ice in the way that it's been for, for generations. And when it breaks up, earlier as the study showed, or when it's um, melting earlier in the season, it's a huge danger to people who go out on it and are used to different conditions. Um, and that's just kind of one of the effects they found from this study. One of the other aspects of, of seal hunting and really all aspects of subsistence lifestyle is uh, that's, your hunt, that's your grocery store. And if the seals aren't there, you're not gonna be able to eat the way you normally do. Uh, what's the impact on just day-to-day -day life for people? Yeah, well, I mean, for centuries, they've been used to getting um, to seal hunting as their, their main food security. And of course, nowadays, there are grocery stores in Kotzebue, but it's still a central part of, um, you know, the lifestyle up there, as well as the fact that Kotzebue is very remote, so you can't always rely on those cargo shipments to come in and, and you know, seal hunting has been a way to sustain the people who live there for, for decades and centuries. Um, but beyond that, you know, Alex and Bobby, the, the two people I talked to from Kotzebue for the article, emphasize that, yes, it's, it's critical for food security, but it's also a huge component of their traditions, of their cultural practices, um, of the generational bonding that goes on. So not being able to hunt has negative consequences across all facets of life up there. You've written a lot of the year uh, about young people and the implications for some of these changes on young people. H how is this story about that? Well, I mean, from the scientists to the elders who live in Kotzebue to the hunters who are hunting now, um, they're really worried about the future generation's ability to be able to hunt these seals because it's changed so much already in the past few years and they're predicting that it's gonna continue changing. Um, there's no trends that would indicate otherwise. And so, you know, it, it's something they really worry about because they don't see the problem going away anytime soon. And I think Bobby the Elder, you can read an article really expressed it, how he's, he's just worried for the future generation's ability to partake in something that he has done his whole life. He's done it since he was 14. Um, and it was, you know, a huge, it's been a huge cornerstone of his life. And to not know if down the line, 
descendants are going to be able to do that, it's, it's pretty stressful. Well, I think one of the extraordinary things about this story, and I'm wondering if people talked about it, is that climate change is happening down here, but yet that's where the impacts are being felt, and there's so little they can do about it. They're just kind of the, the end of the line. Yeah. I think one silver lining from this study was that um, it was a collaborative effort between the university and the researchers and the people who live there who've noticed this for generations who've been saying, hey, we, we already know this is going on. We don't need scientists to come in and tell us and not involve us. Um, and so that collaborative indigenous led aspect of it really allowed them to notice some some details that they might have missed otherwise, um, the researchers that is. And so everyone involved in the project was excited about that aspect um, to kind of go forward and do a more collaborative approach. But um, I, yeah, as you said, definitely big concerns for the Arctic in that sense. Megan Sullivan, thank you. We'll be watching for more reporting. Thank you. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.